I'll start recording the session and then invite everyone in. Recording in progress. Give it a moment for everyone to come through. Okay, perfect. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first session in the Badges webinar series. I'm Ian Kennedy. I'm an orthopedic surgeon from Glasgow. I'll be helping deliver these quarterly webinars, each covering a different aspect of musculoskeletal infection. I would encourage you all to join Badges. It's currently free of charge and it'll keep you updated on all our other upcoming educational events. If you have any questions for the speakers throughout the webinar, please type these into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and I'll go through these at the end of each talk. So our first session today is going to focus on prosthetic joint infection. And joining me as co-host is someone with a vast amount of experience in this area, is current British Hip Society President, Professor Dominic Meek. So over to yourself, Prof. Um, thanks very much, Ian. So we've got um, fantastic speakers of a huge amount of experience tonight. Um, I'm going to start with introducing Mr. Jason Webb, who's a consultant orthopaedic surgeon based in Bristol. He's one of the leading country's leading hip surgeons and international reputation for the prevention and treatment of peripatetic joint infection. And he's an interest in fundamental science research for infection. Uh, particularly in antibiotic bone cement and biofilm. So it's a great pleasure when I ask him to give us his talk in biofilm matters. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, um, Dominic, for those kind words. And thank you for inviting me to take part in this. And so here we go. Uh, I hope everyone can see that. So um, yeah, if tonight is a is is a is a a, a dinner party and and the menu, I think I'm a slightly odd, quirky, unusual starter that may suit everyone's taste, but I think we're going to have a very satisfying and tasty main course from Lizzie and Lee, I'm sure, puddings are going to leave everyone extremely uh, uh, satisfied. So, yeah, as Dominic said, I'm an orthopaedic surgeon in Bristol. These are my disclosures. And my background in this is as though they, although my clinical practice is in prosthetic joint infection, my research background uh, interest is in the sort of basic sciences and biofilm mediated uh, techniques of management. Um, I'm the surgical lead for our regional PJI clinic and Lizzie is the microbiology lead and the real lead. So uh, you'll hear from her next. And because of my sort of research background in it, I was invited at the consensus meeting to be in a rare group, the work group of the, bi the biofilm work group, which um, of over 800 uh, inverted comma experts involved with that whole process, the biofilm group was only 28. Now, fortunately, the majority were basic scientists and microbiologists, so they knew what they were dealing with. And then I think there were a couple of interested amateurs, such as myself, surgeons in that group. But from that, the, the of vital importance is, you know, the group that came back started to the, the UK PJI consensus group, and then that's evolved into badges which is vital for this important clinical subject that becomes ever more prevalent as we see the difficulties with managing infections. And so um, I want to briefly talk to you about biofilm biology and understanding it and why it then represents the clinical correlates of why prosthetic joint infection is hard to manage. Because these are the sort of cases that we get presented with 
uh, in the in in our uh, PJI clinics. And if we understand why uh, the biofilm acts as it does, uh, then we've got a better chance of treating it. But more importantly, to prevent it. In the as we are doing more and more operations, we've got to maintain uh, good prevention. So I'm going to take us back in time quite a long way. The Earth is four and a half billion years old. And for two thirds of that, there have been bacteria and they are superbly evolved to their environment. We've only been around for about 300,000 years. So bacteria have been around 10,000 times longer than us. And so not surprisingly, we don't really matter to them apart from representing a lovely host for which them uh, to colonize. Um, and that's exactly what they've done. But they've evolved uh, not as regards interactions with us, but with other organisms that have been around a long time and probably chief amongst those would be fungi. They've been around for a, a, a sort of a billion and a half years and the evidence is in the evolutionary competition. Fungi produce antibiotics. I mean, so do bacteria produce antibiotics, but fungi produce antibiotics and bacteria respond to that with antibiotics resistance genes and existing in this all important biofilm. Now, it, it isn't a sour relationship. We, we couldn't live without the bacteria. Our adaptive immune system re relied on exposure to them to, uh, to become functional. And the microbiome is in charge of, you know, uh, digestion and many physiological and pathological responses is, are being found to have uh, strong relations to that biofilm, uh, to the microbiome. But evolution, we, uh, evolution went wrong, well, well, human evolution went wrong, because down one branch of the evolutionary tree, we got surgeons, and then right at the end, it got even worse, and we got orthopedic surgeons who thought they could improve the quality of life of their fellow humans who, had, who were middle-aged and had slightly painful joints by putting in big bits of metal and plastic, and suddenly they opened up a whole new area for bacteria to colonise because they set up this unique interaction. We're not dealing in these infections with just the pathogen and the host, but the interaction with the biomaterial that we place into the wound, which totally alters the uh, overall behavior. Now, although biofilm had been understood for over 100 years, it was really the work of Bill Costerton, the microbiologist in the 70s, that showed that sessile bacteria in the biofilm were really responsible for surgical uh, infections. And then Tom Gristina, an orthopedic surgeon from Florida, uh, did a lot of early work with him. So for once, orthopedics was ahead of other surgical specialties in understanding the importance of this in surgical infections and understanding why it was so hard to manage them. And if you look at the key sort of uh, phrases or, or points in a definition of the biofilm, you won't go wrong if you remember that we are dealing obviously with bacteria that become intimately and irreversibly related to the substratum and the biomaterial with, with which they lie upon, that then uh, they are then protected by this matrix or glycocalyx that, uh, that we'll come on to discuss, and um, uh, it alters their phenotype. So they behave entirely different to their planktonic versions. Now, I wouldn't dare to go into the microbiology when I'm in uh, such hallowed uh, company, but broad headlines, we deal predominantly with gram positives of which um, the staphylococci are chief, and they are much harder to kill than in our other uh, interactions in medicine. A, a brief audit from our PJI clinic looking at the prevalence of the organisms we deal with. This was some time back, but we see that over two thirds are staphylococci, over three quarters are gram positives, and then we've got some gram negatives, and then a smattering of mycobacteria and fungi in the sort of immunocompromised hosts. So let me just take you through the biofilm biology. First of all, what's it made of? Was most things on this planet is predominantly water, but then it's got the bacteria, their breakdown products, and this all-important matrix. And, and some scanning EMs and light microscopy from some of our research showing it really is this protective layer that lets the bacteria do their thing. So artificially, I mean, obviously it's a continuum, but artificially the biofilm uh, life cycle is described as being in different phases, the attachment and adhesion phase, accumulation, maturation, and then dispersal. So I'll deal with the with each of those. And it's often presented in a schematic such as this. 
my main point when I uh, teach and, and or, or talk to surgical audiences is that we must remember that every single one of our operations is contaminated. And, and, and um, the whole point in what we do during the operation as preventative measures and in the first 24 hours or so afterwards is in making sure the inoculum is small enough or that we kill that small inoculum so it doesn't then become uh, a, a clinical infection. So let's talk with, I think, the most important phase, the adhesion and um, uh, attachment phase. And this is often described as forming two processes. You've got an initial reversible phase where physical factors are related. Uh, and then you move into a second phase, which is irreversible, where there are molecular and cellular interactions between the bacteria and the substratum. Um, and, and, and you've really lost the battle already by that stage. So every bit of biomaterial we put into the body gets coated in blood and in the blood you have got your plasma and um, you get this conditioning layer that makes it advantageous for the bacteria to land with all of their various uh, surface uh, alterations. Um, those early stages, it is the physical factors. It's things like the electrostatic forces, the surface morphology, the um, surface tension, and the sort of relative hydrophilicity and phobicity of the region. Once there are enough bacteria, we then get some cellular interactions. And so into a bit more detail, first of all, in the plasma, it is the fibrinogen and fibronectin that form the conditioning film that lets the bacteria land. But in that second phase of adhesion, you get these interactions with these bacterial surface adhesion proteins that are so important. These have all been studied in staphylococci, um, where these really start to bind to um, everything else and make them a really stable uh, attachment of bacteria. The next phase is the accumulation and maturation really involve multiplication of the bacteria and pr production of the glycocalis, the slimy layer that protects them and, you know, so-called the matrix. So what is the matrix? Well, it's exopolysaccharides, DNA and proteins. And as this process moves forward, we get these sort of mature biofilms with these sort of mushroom type shapes where they're often polymicrobial. We have gaps or, or, or spaces where nutrients can diffuse in and waste products diffuse away. And, and we really are dealing with something that is, is now, we've lost the battle. We're now dealing with treatment rather than prevention. Even worse, there's a control of these, these colonies um, by uh, the process of quorum sensing. Once there are enough bacteria, then the concentration of extracellular uh, proteins, oligopeptides, things like that, reach critical levels so that they alter the behavior and the phenotype of the bacteria uh, sort of housed within. And then finally, once it reaches a critical population size, then the, the, the biofilm is, is going to disperse and detach. Now, although some organisms can leave in a relatively vulnerable planktonic phase, for staphylococci, they tend to be released with a, with a clump of the matrix around them, thus protecting them as they spread elsewhere in the wound or, 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 or further afield. And really, that's one of the reasons why gram staining is no longer really recognized as a useful investigation for potential PGI, because the stain can't get into those rafts of bacteria, even if they're sitting there. So there we have it. We've got this, this continuum that goes from initial inoculum through to a, a prosthetic joint infection. Some of the, the, some other of the uh, factors that are, that are key in its virulence. The bar film varies in size from 50 microns up to, in some cases, a few millimeters. And, and as it gets bigger, you get variable access to nutrients and oxygen, which changes the cellular turnover of bacteria, making them harder to kill or target. And then other factors that have been shown to be present, calcium ions are in high concentration at the surface, and that blocks the ingress of charged antibiotics such as aminoglycosides. Surface bacteria can denature antibiotics, and then the pH gradients that go down as you get deeper in um, prevent antibiotic access. So we've only really got rifampicin that is said to penetrate biofilm to any significant extent, but this is because there are all these processes. There is increased uh, expression of resistance genes within sessile bacteria in the biofilm compared to their planktonic phase. And as I say, their phenotype changes so that they turn over less rapidly, making them less vulnerable to antibiotic attack. And then finally, they disable the immune system locally because they attract in the glycocalyx, attract in the uh, macrophages, they release their reactive oxygen uh, species, but it doesn't really damage the glycocalyx, 
That does, however, set up a cytokine cascade, which brings more macrophages in that similarly discharge their sort of killing mechanisms, but they don't actually kill off the biofilm. And then you're left with this sort of immunoincompetent fibroinflammatory zone that, that essentially allows the biofilm to flourish and spread further. And all of these factors together led um, Costerton to say that compared to their planktonic phase, the bacteria contained within a biofilm are probably about a thousand times harder to kill. They really sort of represent a city where these bacteria are protected both chemically, physically and immunologically. And all of the in vitro work shows that there's a there's a similar time frame where we've got about 24 to 48 hours to effectively prevent the development of a mature biofilm. So just to finish, what are some of the strategies that have applied science, the application of science, to, to, to uh, try and prevent them? Well, there are some strategies that we've used for a long time and we still rely on. If, however, we get an infection and need to treat it, then a cunning plan is required. And that cunning plan has two very simple elements that must always be obeyed. You've got to remove the biofilm and therefore you need to remove the biomaterials on which is surface it is adherent. And then you need to combine that with antibiotics of appropriate strength and uh, sensitivities based on your microbiology interaction um, to kill off the stragglers. OK, but prevention, as we've said, has got to be our goal. So strategies that are relevant towards that. Well, we know from registry data and from you know basic science data and clinical studies that if you give appropriate systemic antibiotics to reach bactericidal levels in this in the tissues as you operate on them, you reduce your infection rates, and that's killing off those planktonic bacteria as they arrive. But as it's a surface phenomenon, if we make the surface toxic as well, then we can add to that benefit and prevention. And that's also been shown. And really the work of Buchholz and Engelbrecht at the Ender Clinic in 1970, adding antibiotics to bone cement, has was shown to be effective in treating and preventing. The reason it works is you get very high concentrations just where you need it. And here, Boucher's group in, at, uh, in Groningen showed that those tiny gaps that you get between the bone and the cement and the cement and the implant, you can get incredibly high concentrations. And with standard antibiotic loaded bone cement with aminoglycosides in, by two hours, you'll get in concentrations that are that are up at about a thousand times the MIC. Now, they don't spread further afield and cause toxicity, but they are probably why even with emerging bacterial resistance, they're still effective at reducing the uh, growth of those newly landed bacteria. And what other strategies might be useful or relevant based on an understanding of the biofilm? Well, first of all, vaccines to those components that uh, that uh, of the biofilm that keeps the biofilm together. So those um, bacterial surface adhesion uh, proteins, targeting those ha have been studied in animal models. Enzymes to physically um, disperse the, the biofilm sort of uh, and then taking away the protection of the bacteria, interfering with the quorum sensing so that the, the, the sort of mature behavior uh, is disrupted. And then finally, other strategies as regards the surface. There have been many strategies looking at this. You can put antibiotics onto metal. You can use antiseptics or, or, or other metals. Um, and we know that antibiotic loaded bone cement uh, and antibiotic loaded um, as titanium perform perfectly well. But I think the finally, the nanoparticle type research where you're changing the surface topography and, and, uh, and metallurgy of things like titanium, where bacteria are killed the moment they land, is really useful. So in summary, I think biofilm does matter because it so shows us what a sort of foe we're up against and how we need to be on top of our game in order to, uh, to beat it. So thank you very much for listening. Um, thanks very much. Um, I don't think there's any questions in the chat, but based on um, what you've described about the biofilm being very difficult to remove, do you think there is a place for DARE still? I absolutely do. You just got to think, I mean, we know that bar film, uh, well, dares are successful in depending on how quickly you do them mm. and what the initial presentation and therefore uh, origin of the infection is that they are successful. And we would quote to our patients, you know, sort of three quarter chance, but you've got mm. to catch them early. And if they're a sort of um, a hematogenous spread, I think they're one of the best types because you know that they're invading into the joint. 
the surfaces that you will deal with in a dare, you're probably more likely to be successful. A repeat dare, no, I don't think that works. And honestly, if we if we think our dare is going to work, we've got to have removed all the bits uh, that, that that we can do. And therefore, maybe we need to be slightly more extreme with our dares rather than, um, you know, the evidence from the world literature is the less good, you, the less sort of thoroughly you do your dare, yeah. the less likely it is to be successful. You do wonder if you just extend into a one stage revision, though. That's yeah, it. well, I mean, dares now are becoming a one stage. If you've got a polished taper stem, you change the stem. So, yeah, realistically, there, there are 1.5 or whatever we say in there. A okay. couple of questions coming through from the chat, just to follow on from that. Um, optimal duration of dare, presumably, meaning how long after duration of symptoms do you think is acceptable to still perform a dare? So, um, Zimmerly's group in Basel are probably the most robust on that, and they, on their algorithm, say three to four weeks what we do in the real world is we're pragmatic. We get told someone's been, you know, they come in on call and you go, well, they, the symptoms started at three weeks ago and then they had this funny wound and then they've been under the physicians for a while and now it is. So we we push the margins, but I think the quicker you do it, from our experience, I think everyone's experience here, the quicker you do it, the better mm. chance you have. And so, it, then it goes into all the comorbidities and things like that and the yeah. bugs. There's a lot of questions. I'll just ask one more before moving on. Um, is there any difference in biofilm between gram positive and negative organisms? Yeah, so some organ yeah, so it's all to do with how well they're good sort of good slime producers. Uh, and staph epi is sort of more presented in presented joint infection for sort of our type of jobs rather than say trauma, uh, because they are so good at producing slime and some subspecies produce it better. Um, but then there are some real kickers in the gram negative world, the pseudomonas and things like that. They really can produce just fantastic uh, biofilms. And it is subtly different, but it's based on a theme. And even things like TB produce a biofilm, but it's just not based on quite the same proteins. It's more of a, uh, you know, it's called the pellicle. But yeah, so yeah, they all do. Uh, and, uh, and and that makes them difficult to treat. Okay. So what Thank you, come Max Jason, through. summarizing all that in a... Yep. A really fantastic lecture. Um, so it's Dr. Elizabeth Darley, qualified actually in the University of Dundee um, and subsequently trained in infectious diseases and medical microbiology, took up her post though in North Bristol NHS Trust and she's the lead clinical uh, doctor for bone and joint infection. So it's a great privilege to ask her to give us a talk on selecting oral antibiotics uh, for purposes of joint infection. I'm sure given the recent MHRA advice uh, on quinolones, there may be some topics of discussions afterwards. Thanks very much, Elizabeth. Uh, lovely. Thank you. And thank you for the invitation um, to come and present today. Um, so uh, as you've just heard, I'm one of the microbiologists at NBT. I work with Jason and the team of orthopedic surgeons. And for about 20 years now, we've um, been doing the joint infection clinics together. So knees and, and hips predominantly and a few other stragglers who join us. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, oral antibiotic options and what we what we use. Um, and I'm going to share my screen just now. Okay, is that is that clear for everybody? Yeah, great, thank you. Okay, so um, I think I think there's probably a lot that we could um, look at today in terms of oral antibiotic therapy. Um, there are a lot of questions that still need to be answered, and um, the ones that I thought of immediately were switch therapy. Um, I think we're all probably very comfortable now with the idea of switching to oral therapy quite early on, um, but when exactly uh, do we switch? Um, what about combinations versus monotherapy and um, when would you use a combination and when is it better just to settle for a single agent? Um, there's still a lot of active debate about when to add rifampicin into your um, therapy, uh, particularly when there's metal work in place. Um, and then uh, how long would you continue to treat for? And is there a role for suppression therapy at the end of a, what we might consider a therapeutic course? And if so, do you use the same agent or a different one for how long or when do you stop? Um, and then finally, um, prophylaxis. And there's still a lot of ongoing discussion about what the optimal agents are. But I'm going to leave all of those alone uh, and just focus on um, what antibiotics might you choose for your oral switch therapy. Um, and 
illustrate what we what we do at North Bristol Trust and, and why. So um, just a, a little bit of a foundation. So this is the IDSA guidance, um, and it's quite clear that um, oral therapy has a role um, in treatment of these kind of patients. However, it's not entirely clear um, about when you might switch. Um, and it's not clear at all um, in some cases about whether or not you want to give suppression and how that might look and what you might choose. Um, and you have to be um, on your toes about what procedure you're actually doing and what organisms you've got, because the advice varies, as you can see here, for whether or not you've got staphylococcal infection or anything else, and whether there's metalwork here in one stage or it's coming out. But as I said, I'm not really going to talk an awful lot about that um, today. Um, I'm going to sort of hove in on what the antibiotics are. So Jason's already um, shown a nice slide of what the common culprits are. And I, I think this will all be very familiar to you. So staphylococci are the big ones and then streptococci and then various um, proportions of miscellaneous other bacteria. And gram-negative organisms, so things like gut flora, E. coli, Pseudomonas klebsiella, that kind of thing, are becoming slightly more of a problem now than they were maybe 10, 15 years ago. And that probably reflects the kind of patients we're dealing with and their longevity and the comorbidities they have. And possibly uh, how many antibiotic courses they're actually getting um, in their medical career now compared to 10, 15 years ago. So uh, how do you decide what you're going to, to, to give? So the way I look at it is... Um, What's the spectrum of activity? Is it, is it going to work? And that's not always as straightforward as just looking at a laboratory report, which will have sensitive or resistant and sometimes slightly unhelpfully intermediate. Um, but that's, that's a very obvious starting point. How potent are the antibiotics? They're not all the same, despite what the lab report might imply. Uh, does it matter whether the antibiotic that you're going to choose uh, is bactericidal or just bacteriostatic? And um, can we even remember what that actually means? I suggest it probably doesn't matter um, if the surgery has got rid of most of the infection in the first place. Um, it's probably more important if metal work has to stay in situ and can't be removed for, for mechanical or other reasons. Uh, and then we talk a lot about bone penetration. And bone penetration is really, really hard to understand because um, most studies look at single snapshots of bone penetration. Um, if they're in humans, they're usually at the point of excision of bone, which may or may not be infected. And if they're um, animal studies, there's no long-term follow-up. Um, there's one end point, and that point um, is not, there's nothing after that. So once the, the animal uh, has reached the end of the study, then there's no, how, how are they doing in a year's time or two years' time um, or after the therapy stopped. Biofilm activity is very important, and um, Jason's just sort of um, given us a fantastic overview of uh, what, what a difficult um, area of treatment that creates um, and how we really need to sort of be mindful of that, I think, in our preventative measures. Um, and then we think about oral bioavailability, and I think this is very important because there are some antibiotics which are highly bioavailability, but highly bioavailable, and they're the ones I'll be talking about. But there's others that look good, maybe, perhaps like flucloxacillin, but they're only 50% bioavailable um, when you take them orally. So they, you don't get a lot of it for your money, and um, possibly would avoid those. And then there's the interactions, and we're definitely going to talk about that. So this is a um, very simplified table of what we tend to do at North Bristol with our patients. Um, who've got prosthetic joint infection. And it, and it fluctuates depending on what the organisms are sensitive to and also whether there's metal in or out and also what the long-term surgical plan is for the patient. But this, this is, gives you a, a sort of a very broad idea. So um, MSSA, staphylis, equally probably would apply for culture-negative um, infection as well. Um, they start with their standard IVs, flu clocks, maybe with infamacin, maybe not at that stage. And then we like quinolones and rifampicin for oral we'll switch therapy. That's my, that was my first line therapy um, for patients with bone and joint infection. And it has served us very well. There's a good literature base for it. 
Um, and the patients tend, in my experience, to tolerate it very well. That's our finding locally. But if that's not suitable for any reason or it's not susceptible, then clindamycin and afampicin um, are a good second line choice, quite well tolerated as well. And then third line, doxycycline, which is really a very good drug in terms of bone penetration and spectrum of cover, but it's not so well tolerated. And then for MRSA, which I have to say, fortunately, we see very little of in our PJI patients in North Bristol, um, start with bank, plus or minus rifampicin. And then the options, roughly in order, are probably doxycycline, clindamycin, septrin, and then maybe delafloxacin, which is um, a newish quinolone and has anti-MRSA activity and broad gram-negative activity too. And then coagulase negative staphs, very similar, same sort of um, antibiotics. Um, again, if they can um, be treated with a quinolone and it's susceptible, that would be my first line. Um, and I've just made a note here that um, to remind me to, to, to advise you that Flucroxacillin testing, standard disc testing that we do in the laboratories for um, most organisms is not reliable for coagneg stat. So be very careful if you see a report that says Flucrox sensitive. It's, it's an unreliable result unless it's had further testing, which most labs um, don't do and, and quite reasonably don't do. It just means it's not necessarily one to pay attention to. Um, and then if you extras phosphomycin and pristinomycin, and I'll talk a bit about those in a moment, um, they're not used so commonly. So uh, moving down the list of organisms, entrococcal, we see quite a lot of this. Um, if they're sensitive to amoxicillin, then that's a great drug, both IV and orally. It's not brilliant at bone penetration, but it's it's reasonable. Um, and unfortunately, entrococci tend to be very resistant organisms, so you don't have as much choice as you'd like. Um, and that often um, really directs what you're going to do next. So uh, if they're sensitive to septrin, cotrimoxazole, that's a useful drug. Linezolid is great, but as you're probably aware, it's limited to about 28 days. And then after that, um, you're really... Uh, every extra week of therapy is a gift because patients do develop side effects, but I'll mention those in a moment. Um, pristinomycin, now this, this is a bit, um, bit old-fashioned uh, and it's actually quite difficult to get hold of quite a lot of the time, but uh, it's a very useful drug if the entrocopis is an entrocopis fecium and what that means is that it's going to be intrinsically resistant to amoxicillin um, and more resistant. So crystallinomycin can be useful, but it's quite hard to get hold of. And I think there's only really one supplier of it. And when they run out, um, we all have to wait. So that's, it, it, it sort of, um, it takes and it gives, gives back at the same time. Then uh, streptococci. So these are things like the group A strep, um, also viridum streptococci, maybe not quite so common. Group B streptococci, I think we're seeing those um, a little bit more now, maybe related to comorbidities in the patients. Uh, so they are almost invariably sensitive to amoxicillin, which is great. Um, often sensitive to clindamycin and septrin. Um, generally sensitive to lidesilid, but that's very much fourth line because of the side effects and the restrictions on, on duration. Uh, and there are other agents. So sometimes you could use a novel quinolone such as um, moxifloxacin or levofloxacin if they test sensitive. And then coliforms and coliforms are generally um, very susceptible to ciprofloxacin. So this has been a really valuable drug to date. Um, and you can give it pretty much from the outset because it's hugely bioavailable. It's almost 100%. So as soon as somebody uh, can eat their breakfast, lunch and tea post-op, they can, in my book, move on to ciprofloxacin if you've got a susceptible gram negative. Um, and then pseudomonas, these are a little bit more tricky because they're intrinsically pretty resistant organisms. If they're susceptible to the quinolones orally, that's great. If they're not susceptible to the quinolones, then you have no oral option at all um, for these uh, organisms. Um, so it's IV all the way. So we treat the quinolones with respect and we introduce them after a course of something else so that you debulk the infection effectively and get on top of the symptoms with something like tazosin, caftazidine. And then when you feel that you're tidying up, bring in the quinolones at a high dose um, to reduce the risk of resistance developing, which otherwise happens pretty frequently and pretty early. So um, I'm just going to go into a bit more detail now about the, the actual uh, choices of antibiotic, because I think this is what is sometimes hard to understand if you're not a microbiologist and dealing with them every day. 
So, so until 48 hours ago, um, these slides were sort of standalone. Um, I've now got an extra slide and we'll come to that. So quinolones are, are, are very good in that they have excellent bioavailability. They get into bone tissue very well. Generally, patients, I was going to say, tolerate them very well. And our experience um, in the clinic at North Bristol, from 20 years experience of using these first line, and we've been using an um, early oral switch since the first days of this clinic. And I think it was about 2004, 2005, when we very first started these clinics. Um, patients get on fine, and we haven't, bar a few patients, had problems with them, certainly no more than we have experienced with other classes of antibiotics. That may not be your experience, and that may not be what the evidence is going to show us from the MHRA, but that's our experience. They're not equal, they're not interchangeable. So levofloxacin is an oral quinolone, which is much more active against gram positives than cipro. So we recently switched over from cipro rif to levo rif for our gram positives and, and culture negative patients. Um, Delafloxacin, we haven't used yet in our clinic, but it's got more uh, gram negative activity and it also covers MRSA. However, um, when we think about the quinolones, we have to remember the side effects. And there have been various warnings that come out um, over recent years about tendonitis, Achilles tendonitis particularly, prolonged QTC intervals, um, and the risk of moving into a uh, torsal department if you do develop prolonged QTC. And there's also been a recent um, report on increased risk of aortic aneurysm dissection. And I'll mention that in a moment. So the risk of prolonged QTC, I mean, it's a very real thing. It's much more likely to happen with moxifloxacin than it is with Levo, and more likely with Levo than Cipro. So Cipro is um, low risk for prolonged QTC. Moxifloxacin, much higher risk. Moxifloxacin also um, had some alerts a year or two ago about uh, liver failure. So we don't tend to use moxifloxacin, even though it's got most anti gram positive activity. Um, so the, the advice was um, until Monday, uh, don't use a fluoroquinolones. If you can use anything else, if it's a mild to moderate infection, I'm not going to read all of this. You can, you can read it. You may be familiar with it anyway. Uh, and if patients report any symptoms such as um, muscle pain, joint pain, etc., cetera, um, take notes, stop the antibiotics promptly and, and um, investigate further. Now, this is a, this is a table from a paper um, unrelated to the quinolones, but just had a really nice table about the prolonged QTC interval. And, and for those of you who aren't cardiologists, um, we maybe don't think about it or, or, or recognise it too often in our patients, but essentially um, uh, the risk is that the patient goes into a serious arrhythmia. Um, and what I wanted to show here was that when you look at the quinolones roughly halfway down the table, they're actually much less likely um, uh, to predispose to this prolonged QTC than the macrolides that we give very, very frequently for our patients with CAP and pneumonia who come through the door. Uh, Linezolid um, also has a sort of modest profile there too. So I, I think that we have to be careful that we don't overcall the risk. If patients um, don't have an ECG um, in our clinic, then they get one if we're going to start a quinolone. And so long as that looks normal, then we will prescribe them um, a quinolone. If they have any predisposition to it, then we might give them Cipro and just ask them to um, be mindful of any symptoms uh, or we might with withhold them completely. Um, but I just included that to sort of try and put it in context. And then there's the AAA um, uh, anxiety. So this was a paper and, and some evidence which showed that there was a, a threefold risk of either dissection or AAA in patients who had quinolones, and therefore um, we should adopt a lot of caution in giving them to anybody who had any underlying risk. Um, and the, the feeling was this was related to the, the collagen again. Um, however, um, a recent paper in JAMA, um, looking at over 3 million patients in a, in a crossover study, found that there was no increased risk once you remove the confining factors that went with it. Um, and they compared it to other classes of antibiotics and said anybody who's had antibiotics is more likely than, than not than, than the naive patients to have um, an aortic aneurysm dissection, but the risk is still very, very small. Um, and it's not class specific. So that was very reassuring. And I was just feeling reasonably happy about that uh, until in the swimming, until we got the MHRA warning. 
I'm sorry, I don't know why this slide hasn't come out, so I'll just tell you what it says. It essentially says that you may not use um, quinolones um, first line for anything unless the patient uh, has had side effects um, to the existing therapy, uh, resistant dictates that you must use it, and there's nothing else. And that's going to be a real, real problem, I think, for treating these types of deep-seated infections because they are very good drugs. And if they are removed from our sort of armamentarium of what we can have, then I think uh, it's going to have a significant impact on patients' morbidity and mortality um, down the line uh, if we have to use other antibiotics. However, at this point in time, it's an MR MHRA warning. There have been no further comments on the evidence or what's behind it. Um, and so I'm very keen that we get more information about this so that we can consider the implications of it and understand why we've moved away from the position of um, risk assess your patients before you give them crinolones. Think about the risks of tendonitis. Are they on steroids? Are they diabetic? Um, do they have, uh, are they transplant patients? Do they have risk factors for tendonitis to move into it? You cannot give it unless it's your last antibiotic. We'll take questions about that later, maybe. So, rivampicin, a very good drug. I'm sure I don't need to sell this to you. It does reduce linezolid concentrations. Also, probably, septrin and clindamycin concentrations. However, a very nice study looking at clindamycin and rivampicin in treatment found that there was no clinical impact if the levels were reduced slightly. Uh, it's obviously contraindicated um, for some patients on anticoagulants, on anti-epileptics, um, the contraceptive pill. And there's an ongoing debate about when you would add it so would you give it to somebody when the metal work is freshly in, when it's been in for a while, only if it's taken out? You can't use it as a therapy ever because you get very rapid resistance um, and uh, you need to monitor the LFTs. Flindamycin, another very good drug and very fond of flindamycin. Um, if the organisms are susceptible and that's gram positive organisms, then it's, it's a good go-to antibiotic. It's highly bioavailable. But, Bioavailable, nearly 100%. It's very good at getting to bone. It probably does get into biofilm as well. Um, it's got a, a reputation for being pseudophagenic, but um, not really, I don't think, in, in the way we use it now. Um, and um, be generous with the dosing. Doxycycline, a bit old fashioned, sort of went out of vogue some years ago, but it is a very good drug. It, again, if the organisms are susceptible, and they often are. Very bioavailable, um, very good bone penetration. You can use it with rifampicin as well. It's um, not that well tolerated. You have to tell patients to have something in their stomach and stay upright for probably an hour after taking it. Otherwise, they'll get um, gastritis and often feel quite nauseous. And they have to stay out of the sun, which is not generally a big problem in this country. Um, but um, they do need um, uh, to think about how they take it. And it's not always very well tolerated. Um, Septrin um, is also having a bit of um, a, a comeback in the last sort of couple of decades. Um, it's a good drug. It's active against staph aureus, carbonic staph, and some streptococci, but not all, um, and some enterococci, and also gram negative organisms. Um, however, um, it did have its own MHRA warning some years ago regarding bone marrow failure. So you must monitor the full blood count for patients who are going to take it. Uh, you also must monitor the use and ease um, in potassium because it um, may cause a, a rise in potassium and um, AKI. Uh, and of course, it has a bit of a reputation of causing rushes and Stephen Johnson's um, syndrome. Although uh, in our practice, I think we've seen rushes very rarely and even more rarely a sort of Stephen Johnson syndrome. Uh, however, for our patients, the bone and joint infection patients, we have to remember you cannot give it with methotrexate. They can't overlap. Uh, you probably shouldn't give it to patients with an EGFR below about 35 because it entails reducing the doses, monitoring levels um, and higher risk of the side effects. Um, but all that said, many patients get on very well with it. Um, and then the other things that we use, so beta lactams and kephrosporins, um, now there are some concerns about bone penetration, some more than others, um, and in oral formulation, the bioavailability is, is very variable between them, so I'd say take advice if you're, you're going to go down that route, but they're not our first or second or even third line antibiotics for the switch. Uh, minocycline, another tetracycline, um, it does cause skin staining. It can be irreversible, and that's particularly problematic if it's on the face. 
and it has been associated with hepatotoxicity. So probably not your first line tetracycline. Linezolid, also very good, very bioavailable, but um, it's got its MAOI interactions. Um, and it also it does cause bone marrow suppression. Some patients never seem to experience this after months and months of therapy. Other patients start to drop their platelets um, exactly on four weeks, and you have to stop it at that point. You can use it again um, in due course once the bone marrow is recovered, but you should expect it to do the same thing again. So it's, it may be a very short-term treatment. Uh, Pristinamycin, I've mentioned, um, there are supply issues. Fusidic acid uh, can be sometimes substituting rifampicin if rifampicin is resistant, but it's not that well tolerated. It makes patients feel pretty sick. Um, uh, I don't tend to ever use the macrolides. Um, I don't think the bone penetration is great, um, and there's usually better agents available. And then fosfomycin, um, we occasionally use if we're backed into a corner in terms of resistance. Um, no one's quite sure what the dose should be, probably something like three grams BD. Um, it can be active against MRSA, entrococci, some gram negatives, and it does get into bone. So uh, just to summarise, uh, I think the early on switch is generally accepted now as a good idea. I think most patients can get on very well with it. I think it's preferable to having home IV therapy they possibly can, no lines. You don't need to uh, worry about staying at home for um, your infusions and injections and so on, which is a good quality of life. Um, but you have to be selective about what antibiotics you use, probably find a, a funny microbiologist who, who can advise on all these um, nuts and bolts. And with the quinolones, I think we have to watch the space. Um, I'm very interested to know exactly how hardline this MHRA advice is. Um, because, as I said, they are a very good class of drug. And I think I've probably spoken too long, so I'm going to stop now. So, um, thanks very much. I think, Elizabeth, maybe just with the time-wise, if we could get you to interact with them on the chat and the question and answers. Um, then, let's, Ian, is there one particular question? Yeah, we could, uh, just one quick question. How quickly would you switch to oral antibiotics if there are oral options? Um, usually within about five days. Okay. Perfect. There's a lot of Perfect. questions for you, Elizabeth. So um, <laughs> I'll let you maybe deal with them. So um, we've now we've got Professor Lee Jays, who's consultant surgeon in oncology, the Department of Royal Orthopaedics in Birmingham, specialist in hip and knee replacements as well, particular revision surgery and infection, and as he puts it, horrendoplasties. Um, he's Professor of Health and Science at Aston University with some stem cell research, but has a huge experience with peripsetic joint infection with his tumour patients as well. So he's going to talk to us about the management of a recurrent infection. Thanks very much, Lee. Thanks very much for uh, having me today at the meeting. It's an esteemed uh, group of people. So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, what we do with when the infection comes back. It's a topic that we don't talk about a lot, really, because we don't like to admit our failures. Uh, for those who haven't seen me before, I work in the Royal Orthopaedic Hospital in Birmingham. We're one of the largest sarcoma units, and that will have some relevance. And we're reasonably academic, so we publish about a paper a month on average. So I do have a conflict of interest. We work in an ivory tower, and we, those of us who work in ivory towers, we always think that everybody's having a much better time than we are because we're often dealing with the uh, more challenging cases. But my biggest conflict of interest is that I do both cancer and uh, infection. And there are a lot of parallels between cancer and infection uh, in terms of treatment strategies, the effect on the patient's life, both quality and, as we're understanding now, their quantity of life. And one of the things we've adopted in the UK is a specialisation uh, an organisation with MDT working uh, around infection, which hopefully will pay dividends in the future. So we get patients from all over the country, predominantly because of our tumour background originally. Um, and this is a paper that was written by Rob Grime and my sort of mentor, looking at tumour procedures that had been in for more than 25 years. So all these patients had had tumour procedures for more than 25 years. And uh, what we can see, 230 patients, that the risk of amputation was about 16%, and the risk of lifelong infection was about 1%. And unfortunately, the procedures looked like they uh, 
didn't do so well. And that's because our patients end up having lots of operations because they're put in at a very young age. And the more operations you have, by the time you have four operations, each individual operation carries with it a risk of about 20 to 25%. And the risk of infection remains lifelong. So these tumour patients can tell us quite a lot about peripatetic joint infection. So we get our first time infection and we think, oh, it's okay, we're pretty good, we're all used to dealing with that, I've got lots of options, we can do a DARE, we can do a single stage or we could do a two-stage revision. Uh, but then you get home and you've had a good night out, you've enjoyed yourself and then you get the phone call of shame that says the patient that you operated on a few weeks ago is suddenly uh, pussing out and that makes you feel pretty sad. And you think, oh, I knew I shouldn't have operated on you. Try to blame the patient as much as you can. And you know that they're going to follow you around for the rest of your career now, stalking you, wondering well, how you're going to get rid of that infection. So what is the chance of recurrent infection? Well, the literature is obviously very biased. Uh, if we look at DARES, it's been variably reported to between 0 and 80% failure rate. Single stages, I think, probably have a bit of a positive publication bias, but even... In the least optimistic, uh, there's about a 30% failure rate. And two stages are often over-reported to do well. But again, the literature says that there's between a 0 and 50% rate. So even though we don't like to think about it, a significant portion of our patients are going to fail their treatment for infection. This patient, uh, by Farron's group, 221 patients, their reinfection rate was 12%, pretty good. But 14% didn't get their second stage. There was a 20% complication rate. And the overall mortality of the group was uh, 41% with a median survival of five years. And I want you to think about this as we go through that talk. This recent excellent paper from uh, the NJR showed that, unfortunately, infection rates in primary uh, knee replacements and aseptic revisions unfortunately is increasing as we've heard and that has a very significant effect on their ability to uh, uh, survive uh, and keep the implant. So we looked at our results and we saw we we're pretty pleased with a, a, a pretty much 90% success rate with DARES, single stages, 6% uh, failure rate and 2%, about 10% failure rate. But that's all first-time infections. When we looked at our salvage cases or recurrent infections, we had about a 50% failure rate. And we'll come on to look at that in a bit more detail. And it's the usual risk factors, poorly patients, polymicrobial organisms, uh, what we uh, termed as bad organisms. One surgeon didn't have a great outcomes, but polymicrobial and, and, and bad organisms and the need for a flap all unfortunately did pretty poorly. So what are we going to do now then? Should we get up and say, well, we're going to get, try again or, you know, enough is enough. And if we've had one go at uh, trying to treat infection, should we should we call it a day? Well, what's the literature on recurrent uh, PJI? Well, actually, it's, it's very uh, sparse. So this paper looked at 55 patients who'd had a um, repeat uh, two-stage revision for a failed two-stage Reinfection rate was a third a year and 62% by five years. 22% didn't get their uh, second stage and 50% had reoperations. There was a 16% amputation rate and the overall mortality again was about a third. So it looks pretty dire. There are three types of surgeons I always think. There's the surgeon that thinks, oh, well, I've got an infection. I want to keep my uh, bradycardia and take it nice and easy. And therefore, we'll just go straight to an amputation or we'll, we'll suppress the patients, which is the ID and microbiologist uh, sort of nightmare. Then we have our have-a-go heroes that think they can do everything and uh, are not doing it in a, a specialised uh, centre because the skill sets for a uh, infection surgeon compared to standard orthopaedic surgery is, is quite significantly different, particularly when we come to debridement. So we looked at our results. So we had a case match series uh, of 64 patients. This was done by uh, Mike Power and Jonathan Stevenson and, uh, and myself. Uh, we looked at 32 who'd had their first infection treated at the RH compared to those who'd had a two-stage after having a failed two-stage before. And the headlines were pretty poor. So we had a 91% if we treated it, but only a 50% if it was uh, repeated at the ROH. 
Um, 44% required repeat operations compared to just 9% in the primary group. But when we looked in more detail, we found that only one patient had an amputation, only two patients had died uh, with repeat infection, and actually the other 91% were able to be controlled by further DARES, uh, revision surgery, or an arthrodesis. So actually our long-term control group in both the groups were the same, but we just had to work harder at getting the infection, and the patients unfortunately went through more surgery. So Muhammad Ali said that if you uh, don't lose, if you get knocked down, you only lose if you stay down. So our philosophy, as long with the tumours, is to keep on going as long as the patient wants us to go, but it is very difficult. So it's all very cool, but the point is, can it work for us? What do we do to make it uh, uh, better? Well, what do you need? You need an MDT. You need a micro and ID advice that we've heard from the two excellent talks before me, because we've also shown that there's a massive change in the microbiome between failed infections. You need plastic surgery to help you with flaps and skin coverage, or you have to do your own flaps. And you need experienced surgeons who are uh, concentrating on PJI because, as we've heard from the biofilm talk, uh, that we need to have a radical debridement. And we often end up using a lot of oncology-style prosthesis. But also you need a lot of resilience as a team. You need to keep on going if you can. And perhaps you need a different way of thinking about these uh, difficult problems. So there's been lots of evidence to suggest that if we get early referrals to specialist infection units, that uh, the outcomes are better. Uh, this is uh, Dominic's uh, an, uh, paper that looked at uh, their introduction of, uh, of an MDT showing a massive reduction uh, in the failure rates of uh, treating infection. This paper that came out of the Finnish group showed that in all classes, by the introduction of an MDT and a specialist uh, team that you significantly improved your outcomes in terms of uh, curing infection. But we've just published this paper recently with the uh, London group and uh, the Oxford group, where we looked at the microbiology of the uh, repeat infections. And often the organism changes between the uh, revisions. So you often have a prior exposure to antibiotics. You get more drug resistant organisms. You get more gram negatives and eventually you end up with a higher rate of fungal infection. So by the time you come to your second revision, 43% in our series showed a different organism to the original organism, and 40% of the organisms were now multidrug resistant, as defined by uh, resistant to more than two classes of antibiotics. And this is really has a practical importance, because this is why, even though when we know what the organism was last time, we stay broad with our uh, antibiotics at the beginning, covering both gram negatives and gram positives, and then dropping our uh, gram negative co cover if we haven't grown anything. So coming back to the extreme cases, you know, can we do limb salvage in these cases? Well, clearly this is where you need to use your plastic surgical team uh, or do your own flaps. And often you're not going to go to a uh, another mobile prosthesis and often going to um, some kind of arthrodesis. Debridement for infection, as we've heard uh, uh, in the first talk, is absolutely paramount, especially if we're talking about multidrug resistant organisms. So this is not an adequate debridement of a hip. This is messing around with a spoon around a hip. This, unfortunately, is also not an adequate debridement of a uh, knee. Uh, this is an example of a horrible infection uh, that's been uh, multiply infected. And you can see when we get in, it looks pretty horrible. I'm sorry for anybody who's eating their, their dinner at the moment. Uh, but you need to find that layer between the healthy tissue and the pseudo membrane, And you need to do a radical debridement. And we like to try and get the... Uh, pseudo membrane out all in one layer not because we like to show off but because it helps us keep in the right plane all the way through the operation and here you can see at the end of the debridement we're now wondering whether we can do a first stage because it looks very uh, a single stage but we bottled out and did a two stage with a functional spacer in this case 
We also rely a lot on adjuvant therapy. So we've heard about the local antibiotic delivery and the thousand times concentration. And so we use a lot of local adjuvants, whether it be silver on the implants or whether we use uh, calcium sulfate with antibiotics in. And we all know that antibiotics can't save inadequate surgery. They may be able to help, but they're not going to cure the patient. The last thing that we talked about was the time and unpredictability and the, re the resilience that's needed. Uh, and orthopedic surgeons have always been known as rhinos for having thick skins and charging a lot. But actually, you do need to be resilient if you're going to do this. So this was a case that we dealt with 2017, came in with a clearly infected uh, uh uh, hip, which had always been infected with a peripatetic fracture and uh, staph aureus um, serratia and E. coli, not a, not a great combination with the uh, PET scan showing that we'd had osteomyelitis all the way down. So unfortunately, we did a very radical debridement to this bone as this gentleman had already had four uh, attempts at curing his infection. Uh, when we did our two-stage, all of our cultures were negative. We were very happy with ourselves, and we thought we were all superheroes. And then just a few weeks later, it comes back again with a relatively resistant organism. I don't feel so good now, but we carry on. We did another two-stage, which again showed E. coli. We did another uh, two-stage, and then we ended up on real resistance. Now you can see that we've now got a fungus as well. As E. coli, problems with spacers, total femurs. But actually, by 2021, after many years, we managed to uh, successfully cure the infection with a two stage revision. And uh, you can see that his CRP was uh, returned to normal, and we ended up doing a, a knee replacement on the other side. I talked briefly about maybe the way that we need to look at things differently when we're dealing with recurrent infections. And this is one of my failures lovely lady called Doris, who unfortunately never made it to her second stage. And this risk of dying within five years of PJI is very similar to most common cancers. And we know that all hosts do very badly with two operations. So we took a policy that we decided to get radical with uh, the unwell patients because we found that we had more of these multi-drug resistant organisms in this cohort like we'd talked about. And if we look at them, we can see that the multi-drug resistant organisms do worse acutely and uh, chronically with uh, uh, infections. And if they're associated with polymicrobial organisms uh, in our series, they did uh, even worse. But what we did find that was surprising was that those that had a single stage revision seemed to do better than the two stage revision. And actually, this probably makes sense because antibiotics aren't going to be your answer because a lot of these are resistant to multiple classes of antibiotics. We therefore came up with a strategy of doing dares in our good patients with early onsets, as we heard. But now we do radical one stages on the worst patients because if there is a small benefit from doing a two stage and our patients are in the category where they're going to unfortunately have a poor life expectancy, then actually we want to get them up and about quickly. And so we do radical one stages on the worst patients now, and we save our two stages for the best patients. So this was a gentleman that is 81, diabetes, came in with acute infection, obviously not coping at home, came into the clinic uh, with an abscess and not drip being dressed and wearing clothes covered in pus. So we did a radical one stage with the distal femoral replacement for him. And you can see that his albumin improved quite significantly within the first few weeks. His CRP uh, improved uh, within the first few weeks. And here he is, even though he had a sinus with a one stage, uh, we could function about a year later. 1.5 stage revisions are now very much in vogue, started by the uh, EXA group, uh, showing that you could put a prosthesis uh, back in. Um, and you can do that with tumor prosthesis as well. This was a Hong Kong group that reported it a few years ago. Uh, this is a lady we treated recently who'd had a previous failed MRSA proximal femoral replacement done elsewhere. 
um, and we could do uh, a one-stage uh, revision with them. But because we like to protect ourselves, we'll tell them that this is just a temporary uh, uh, prosthesis and we may come back and change it. So we've got a tumor prosthesis wrapped in uh, antibiotic cement and, and stimulan. And uh, using cement in an acetabular reconstruction, which will only be temporary, but um, hopefully um, once our infection is cured, we can go back in. And we've actually got pretty good results with this. We looked at our first small series with tumor prosthesis and we had a 87% uh, implant survival at, at uh, two years, which is short term. Uh, and we had two failures. So we've talked very briefly about what are the salvage options. Um, antibiotic suppression has been alluded to, but we sometimes use long-term antibiotic spaces. Around the hip, you can use a girdle stone, but we don't like that very often. In, in the extreme cases, we can use a rotation plasty. But we're big fans of arthrodesis around the knee. The problem is with antibiotic suppression, we find is that, that you have to have an oral susceptibility. A lot of the cases, which are the worst cases, are multidrug resistant. You can have a low output fissure, that's okay, but a high output fissure is pretty, pretty miserable. Long-term antibiotic spaces, the advantage is that you've got no metal at the surface, so less biofilm, hopefully. You can add antibiotic su um, suppression. And we've had several places, patients that have had long-term spaces. But the problem is you often can't fully weight bear on them and they will eventually break. This is a lady that had one for three years, uh, was mobile on it until it uh, broke. And then we eventually went back in. But she was culture negative when we went back in. This is a radical tumor resection that got infected. And this patient had a spacer for... 12 years um, again until it broke and we had to change it but he had okay function knee arthrodesia is a very good if you're contemplating an uh, an, an uh, amputation because of the stability they're good for the soft tissues and uh, the lack of bending means that the soft tissues often settle down quite often patients don't like the idea of them but we use a lot of static spaces and if we use a static spacer then they've often had them for a while and get used to it and again the function is um, uh, reasonable and uh, can avoid an amputation but we've published a small series on those as well so in conclusion then i think recurrent infection is difficult it certainly has higher failure rates i think limb salvage is successful but it often needs uh, multiple operations I know the Germans are now quite keen on doing the three-stage operation. I don't think we're going to go that far, but I think we do have to go back in quite quickly if we think that the the two-stage is not working and do a, a radical dare. And I think you get long-term success if you use a MDT input. It's done in specialist centres, and unfortunately you often need to use quite radical surgery. And I would suggest that different approaches may be needed in these patients because of the higher rate of multi-drug resistant organisms. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Lee. Um, Ian, are there any so one or two questions, I know we're going to play the video in a second. Yep, um, quick question, do you think there's a role for silver-coated implants? Uh, so I think that the evidence is difficult uh, because there's a selection bias in, in those that we use. I think there's been multiple papers that show it reduces your early infections, but I don't think it reduces your long-term infections. I think... Um, the different types of silver. So um, we tend to use one with a very high uh, concentration of silver, which eludes, um, it's actually electroplated, so it needs a small drop in the pH to get a big uh, release in the, the the silver ions. I think there's, the in the oncology world, that it's now, they've become a standard of care, but I don't know, um, I don't certainly don't think a randomised trial is, is is possible at the moment on it. Perfect. One further question. If you've got a patient with chronic antibiotic suppression in one joint, would you be happy to do an elective joint replacement on the other side? 
Uh, so I think tumor surgeons think about things a little bit differently. Um, so, you know, when you're dealing with cancer for half your day and then you're dealing with infection, which I think is just as problematic for the patients, then we tend to take more risks. So we do do uh, and have done joint replacements in people with other infections. Um, actually, the literature was the very little literature out there would suggest that the risk of infection actually in the other joint is not as high as you would think. Um, but I think it's a risky strategy, and if you're going to do it, you've got to be, you've got to uh, make sure the patient completely understands the the problem. Personally, I, I we re, we really try hard not to put patients on on antibiotic suppression. Um, so we would be trying to get them both in at the same time. I think. Perfect. Thanks so much. We'll stop the questions at that just now. Um, I just have a quick video that I need to share from our sponsors. Uh, Horace have kindly donated to this um, webinar, which I'll play just now. Thank you for the invitation to speak here quickly on the role of dual antibiotic loaded bone cement in PGI. Of course, we do not speak about its routine use, but about selective situations where the risk for infections or reinfections is high. What is the idea behind the hypothesis that antibiotic combinations in bone cement fight bacterial colonization better than single antibiotic loaded PMMA? Cemented prostheses are particularly prone to bacterial colonizations in fragile patients with a weak immune system. And or if a priori gentamicin resistant bacteria have contaminated the joint space. The claim is two antibiotics are better than one. The reasons why antibiotic combinations are more effective are the following. First, with several antibiotic combinations in PMMA, for example, with gentan clindamycin or with gentan vancomycin, <laughs> a much enhanced mutual release rate of the drugs out of the carrier material. Second, the combination of many antimicrobial drugs broadens the spectrum of activity against gram-positive and gram-negative bugs. Third, the combination of drugs with different targets in the bacterial cells may overcome single resistances and reduces the risk of concomitant resistance development against both agents. Indeed, so-called biofilm inhibition studies have repeatedly shown a stronger and longer sustained antimicrobial action of antibiotic combinations in the cement. This is particularly visible at day nine in this graph, comparing the effects of plain, gentamicin only, and dual antibiotic combination containing cement. In vivo, it was further shown that antibiotic combination therapy in bone cement spaces during staged septic PGI treatment was an independent factor for higher treatment success compared to monotherapy. On a microbiological level, monotherapy spaces were associated with much less growth negative biopsies taken at the moment of reimplantation than the combination therapy. Now, most importantly, is there clinical, albeit preliminary evidence from clinical studies that the use of dual antibiotic loaded bone cement is associated with less infections or reinfections. Yes, there is, as summarized in this review. The infection rates were significantly lower in the dual high-dose antibiotic-loaded bone cement group compared to single low-dose gentamicin group. In the fragile group of hip fracture patients, in aseptic knee revision procedures, in septic one-stage arthroplasties, and even in primary joint replacements with high-risk patients. However, the previous findings of a lower PGI rate in the dual Genta and clindamycin loaded cement group have been challenged by the recently published randomized white 8 trial. Despite the tendency to a low infection rate in the dual antibiotic loaded bone cement group, the p-values in the differences between both groups did not reach the level of significance. Whether this is also influenced 
by the lower than assumed overall infection cases or by the in this trial relatively short observation period of three months remains to be determined. On basis of the chest showing experience, we may conclude dual antibiotic loaded bone cement supports a stronger and more sustained inhibition of bacteria than single antibiotic loaded cement with a wider coverage. First clinical studies indicate superiority of dual antibiotic loaded bone cement. However, the strength of its clinical and health economic impact is still not fully conclusive and may also depend on the overall infection risk. Thank you for your attention. Okay, well, that brings the webinar to a close. Thank you to all our speakers, Jason Webb, Elizabeth Darnley, Luigi's, my co-host Dominic Meek and everyone who signed in to watch. Um, the webinar is going to be available to watch subsequent to this on Ortho TV and Ortho Media. Um, and finally, just consider signing up the badges via the website so you can be notified of our next webinar in the series and kept up to date regarding any of um, our upcoming conferences. Thank you very much. <laughs>